in verse 17, the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up with a purpose. God's telling Pharaoh, you know why I allowed you to come up and become Pharaoh in Egypt? To demonstrate my power in you. To humble you, to crush you, to bury you under the Red Sea. And the truth of that will be known all over the world for the next thousands of years. This is something that happened 3,500 years ago. And all over the world, 3,500 years, people have heard that how God humbled Pharaoh and buried him and his army under the Red Sea. I chose you for that purpose, to demonstrate my power so that my name will be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. And you say, boy, you mean God does things like that? He certainly does. Don't accuse God of injustice. You're not the judge of God. God is the judge. That is another area where you find many Christians sometimes try to judge God. They say, how can God do this? How can he allow this? How can he allow those wicked people to prosper? And this sincere God-fearing man is suffering. Or, how is it I prayed and he didn't answer? Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> that itself shows arrogant pride. I did what Jesus said. I asked in Jesus' name, I prayed and he didn't heal me. Who in the world do you think you are, my brother, sister? You haven't become small enough. You see, I prayed in faith. Well, you'd really have real faith if you had small enough. What you have is not faith. You're too big in your mind to have faith. You think you're a somebody. Well, so it says in verse 18, So God has mercy on whomever he desires. And he hardens whomever he desires. Can you accept that? I can it's the other parallel line. They meet at infinity. They don't meet in my finite mind. They will never meet in my finite mind. I'll never be able to explain it all my life. I wonder if I'll be able to explain it even in eternity. Because I'm not going to be infinite in eternity. I'll be like Jesus, but I will not be infinite. No. So I don't need to explain it. I know it is true. There are many things even in the earth I can't explain, but I know it's true. You know, when I've studied a little bit about the wonders of the working of the human body, the heart, the blood vessels, and the different nerves, and so many things inside the body as I've read and studied a little bit about it, I'm amazed that I have lived up to this age. <laughs> I see. I say, I should have probably died at one week. <laughs> then all these things are functioning so perfectly. And we eat so many things that are not good for us. We get hurt in so many ways and still we are alive today. Haven't you, have you ever wondered about how miraculously your body works and restores things which are damaged? And it's to me a wonder, the human body. It humbles me. I don't take anything for granted. He has mercy on whom he has mercy and he hardens whom he. And then of course the clever man will say in verse 19, Romans 9, 19. Why does he find fault then? Why does he find fault with somebody? Why does he send somebody to hell? I'll give you the answer to that. Not in I don't know. I'll give you another answer. Why does God send somebody to hell? after hardening him. You want the answer? Here it is. Romans 9.20. A very good answer. Who are you to answer back to God? Got it? Have you all got it? Who are you to answer back to God? What's the answer? Just in case you wanted to know. Remember that all your life. Remember Romans 9.20. Who are you to question God? My dear brothers and sisters, I'm very serious. I'm absolutely convinced this is one of the main reasons why many Christians have not grown. Their study of the Bible is to question God, to try and explain all of God when God is a mystery. And you know, perhaps you don't know, or some of you do know, in theological, which is Bible study in the way among Christians, there are 
two among, you know, there are Protestants and Catholics, I know, but in doctrine, there are two main groups among Christians. One, those, they call themselves Calvinists, who the sovereignty of God is the main thing. What I'm saying here, it's one parallel line of the railway track. And the opposite are the Armenians, the people who followed Arminius, these guys followed Calvin. And they're the one who emphasized the free will of man, the free will of man, the free will of man. And there have been great men of God on both sides of this. But the one, there was a very godly man who said, the truth does not lie in one extreme, neither does it lie in the other extreme, much less does it lie in the middle. It's not by joining both these parallel lines together in the middle and make one track. That's not it either. The truth lies in both extremes held at the same time. Leaving those parallel lines without trying to join them, saying they will never meet in my mind. Parallel lines meet only <clears throat> in infinity. Only an infinite, all-wise God can explain how he sovereignly chooses people and how he gives man free will to choose. I cannot explain it. I'll tell you, almost all of Christendom is divided into one of these two. Some who say, I chose. I chose and I accepted Christ. And that's it. That's a very good one line of the railway track. But you haven't got it all. And if you don't have the other, your train will not run the way it should. And then there are the people on the other side who say, well, God sovereignly chose me. And those are the people who believe once saved, always saved. It doesn't matter how I live because God sovereignly chose me and he chose me before eternity and I'm saved and all that and the other. And the one day they stand before the Lord, they'll discover that God never chose them at all. They just imagine. And the proof of it was they lived in sin. <clears throat> so the devil's determined to fool both people. All scripture is inspired by God and given to us that the man of God may be perfect. Paul told Timothy at the end of his life, he said in 2 Timothy 2, rightly divide the word of God. Be diligent. Study hard to rightly divide the word of God. So many people are twisting it. 